Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for his life because he taught us how to live. Thank you so much for his death because he paid our sin penalty. And thank you so much for his resurrection that, Father, he conquered both death, hell, and the grave. That he snatched death out of death for the believer. So, Father, we just thank you so much for all that he has done, that he sits at your right. He rules and reigns the affairs of men, God. He sets up kings and princes and presidents, Lord, that he is the great, great controller of all human affairs. And we cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was in the past, who is in the present, and who is to come, that you truly are Yahweh, the one who has no beginning and who has no end, the one who always existed. Thank you so much for being the great I am. Thank you so much for who you are in our lives, Jesus. Thank you so much for saving us, for sanctifying us, for redeeming us, God. Thank you so much for conviction of our sin. Thank you so much for your word. There's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, God. Thank you so much for the body of Christ, God. Thank you so much for the privilege of prayer. God, we have all the spiritual riches at our disposal, and we have you to thank you so for. So, Lord, we say thank you. We just want to pause and say thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done. You chose me. I didn't choose you. You loved me. I didn't love you first, God. You redeemed me. I didn't have to do anything to save you, God. You saved me, so I want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for who you are. You are our greatest gift. You are our heart's cry. You renew our mind. You transform us from the inside out. Oh, I'm so thankful I don't serve a religion, but I serve a person. I don't have to do a list, but I follow a Savior. So God, I pray that you would be magnified in this day. You would speak to us in this day. Speak to us by your word. But Father, truly you are the blueprint. Let us follow your son. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, morning Antioch. Y'all good? I am ready to preach and get you guys out of here so we can go eat some barbecue. Pastor Carl over here talking about some ribs. I don't eat the swine like Jesus, but for those who do, praise God. I ain't mad at you, but I'm looking forward to some, some other festivities and other food, and we're excited today and excited to uh, baptize my brothers and uh, my sisters and, and to uh, especially baptize my son. You know, I'm a little bit emotional uh, today because my boy uh, has made a profession of faith, uh, was it four years ago, right, Sam? Three, four years ago, he, he got saved in the tub. <laughs> and I got to give my wife a lot of credit for that because she has been diligently uh, sharing the gospel with Josiah and teaching him what it is to be a believer and to yield and to submit his life unto God. And uh, it's, it's funny, she shared the gospel the most, but he actually got saved with daddy, so you couldn't <laughs> figure out how that worked. Uh, but we told him, we said we didn't want him to get baptized until he fully understood it. And he, he looked at us and he said, it's time, daddy, it's time, mama, it's time. And so I am excited to uh, baptize my son and uh, baptize my brother D. Eskridge. Uh, so thankful for you, D. Uh, what a journey we've been on and so grateful that God has captured your heart and uh, and Raiden and Avery, I know they're downstairs, so excited to, to baptize them as well. And so uh, what a day we shall have. But uh, we didn't come here today to talk about that. Uh, we came in here to get into the Word. And today's uh, topic of discussion, and we're continuing our series on how to do church right through the exposition of First Timothy. Uh, it's the exposition of First Timothy. I've been tasked with First uh, Timothy chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. And if you don't mind, uh, Rontrell reminded me something of the, the church back in the South. They, back, at, back home, you know what they tell you when you're about to read the word? You better stand up. <laughs> so <laughs> get up, Craig. Come on, Craig. <laughs> let's get up and let's read God's word. And, 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 and as we dive into the scripture, so today's uh, message is called The Blueprint. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. 
verse 12, it says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love. The Bible says in spirit as well, but uh, I want to make a point in the text. The, the King James and the New King James was uh, uh, translated from the Textus Receptus. You don't have to know what that is. But in most translations, it does not have the word in spirit in there. So your Bible may not have that. Uh, uh, but it also says in, in faith, in purity, verse 13, till I come, give attention, attention to the reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Verse 14, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the, of, of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be made evident to all. Verse 16, take heed your, to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing uh, this, you will save both yourselves and those who hear you. You may be seated. Father God, we pray you bless your eternal word. On a rugged coast where the sea met the land with the world, there stood an old lighthouse, weathered by time, but it's still shining brightly. Its keeper, a man named Elias, who was known throughout the village, not just for his duty, but for his character. For he was a figure of wisdom, kindness, and integrity. A blueprint for those who were around him. Elias had inherited the lighthouse from his father, who inherited from his grandfather. It was a legacy passed down through generations and generations. But Elias understood that his role was not just to keep the light burning. He wanted to be a guiding example for others. Every day, Elias would rise before dawn and make his way up the winding staircase of the lighthouse, ensuring the beacon was in perfect working order. His meticulousness was a model of dedication. He took great care in maintaining the lighthouse. Knowing that its light was more than a mere signal, it was a symbol of safety and hope for sailors navigating the treacherous waters. One stormy night, as Elias checked the lighthouse, he noticed a small fishing boat. Struggling against the waves, the crew was very inexperienced. Their boat barely holding together. Elias knew the storm would only worsen, and the boat's chances of survival were slim to, to none without guidance. Despite the, the gale and the cold, Elias set out in a small rowboat using the light from the lighthouse to guide him. He reached the fishing boat and with great effort managed to help the crew aboard his own boat, and he steered them back to the shore, guiding them through safety to safety through the storm. The next morning, the villagers were astonished. Elias' bravery, selflessness became the talk of the town. But to Elias, it wasn't about the recognition. It was about the example that he wanted to set. His actions had shown that true leadership and guidance came not from grand gestures, but from consistent, quiet dedication and a willingness to help others in their time of needs. Over time, Elias' legacy grew. The villagers inspired by his example, began to follow his lead. They worked harder and showed greater kindness and helped one another more than ever before. The lighthouse was no longer just a beacon in the storm, but it was a symbol of the values Elias lived. Elias' story has passed down through generations, and while the lighthouse continued to guide sailors, it also stood as a testimony of the power of living as a blueprint. People didn't look, to, look at just at the light. It was a life behind it that inspired them to shine brightly in their own ways. And so the lighthouse on the rugged coast remains a beacon of hope, an example for all who saw its light, just as Elias has always intended. This, this example of Elias draws an example of a, a blueprint. And Elias changed this whole village with his example, with his integrity, with his consistency. The apostle Paul is telling his young mentee, uh, Timothy, who was a pastor in Ephesus, to do the same thing, to leave a blueprint and to leave a legacy. Before I dive into the text and exposit, exp, uh, do a special expository teaching in the text, I want, to, I want to, to, for you guys to go to verse 11. As Pastor Al preached last week, verse 11. So a lot of people, theologians, believe that this verse was only for pastors. But I want to tell you this today. This is not just for Timothy, but it's, just, it's also for everybody in the church. He commands him in, in verse 11. He says, these things I command, and he says, also, I want you to teach. So get this. 
I want you guys to understand this. We are all ministers of the gospel. Can I get an amen? We are all ministers of the gospel. Pastors are not at some level and everybody else is at another level. No, 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 no. We are all ministers of the gospel. Pastors will be held accountable for what they teach and what they say. But we are all held accountable to be led by love, led by the spirit, and led by God's word. So we're all ministers of the gospel. Pastor Carl demonstrated it earlier that we're all level at the cross. I might have a different function and a role than you, but guess what? That don't make me more better than you or, or I have to live a more righteous life than you. God has called us all to be the example to wherever we go. And we're to follow Elias' example. And Paul says, no, 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 I want you to follow the example of Christ. More than pulling people out of the water, which is important, guess what we're doing? We're pulling people out of hell. Because people are captured in the, the depths of hell. They don't know they, that they're on their way to hell. To, but, but God has called us to be an example, to be a light, to pull them from the depths of hell. Pastor uh, uh, Ken Hutcherson, the founding pastor of Antioch Bible Church, said he would say we want to depopulate hell and populate heaven. That's our call as believers. And so in Typical Jonathan Rainey fashion, I'm going to teach this text. I might preach a little bit, you know, but, but bump, bump your neighbor. Bump your neighbor real quick. Say, 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 neighbor, you may not feel good today, but you're going to understand good. <laughs> One more time, bump your neighbor. Say, neighbor, he didn't come here to make you feel good. <laughs> he came here to make you understand good. So in typical Jay Rainey fashion, I have five points today for five verses. My wife is going to love that, right? <laughs> She's going to get on me about that tomorrow. <laughs> but we have five points, and we'll get out of here, and, 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 and we'll dive in. Point number one, we see in verse 12, we, we are to be the example. Paul said, let no one despise you for your youth, but set, a, set uh, the believers an example in speech, conduct, love, purity, and, and faith, and purity. Get this. Paul encourages Timothy. He says, don't let people phase you. Man, is that a thing in our culture today? He says, don't let people look down upon you. In essence, and, and can I say this in Negro culture, in black culture, we say, don't let people punk you. You know what I'm saying? Stand your ground. Stand in your authority. Stand in who you are. Stand in your true identity. He says, don't let them bully you around. He says, don't let them phase you. Don't let them push you. Don't let them punk you. Don't let them, don't let them pu pu push you around. He says, stand in your authority. Get this. Timothy was a young pastor. He was probably in his 30s. And he says, he says, don't let anybody despise your youth. The word youth in the original Greek is notes. And get this, in the original Greek, a person who would be considered a youth was under 40 years or, or younger. It ain't just for teenagers. <laughs> because in the Roman army, you had to serve up to 40 years old. Man, imagine going to a war and you're a 39-year-old guy with a bad hamstrings and knee and you got to go fight somebody like, man, come on, Caesar, can we just all get along? You know what I mean? But he says, don't let anybody look down upon your youth. He says, walk in your not man-made authority, but God-given authority. God has given him authority because he is in the office of a pastor. And I want you guys to understand this. Being a pastor is a hard thing. Y'all need to pray for us pastors. Pray for us chaplains, pastors, because get this. I don't know if you guys know this, but the average person has seven relational events that, that rock them to their core as a person. A pastor has eight per year. Seven relational events where people turn their back on, when people, when people don't show up. So I want you to pray for your pastors. When you pray in the morning, when you pray at night, make sure you, you, you keep your pastors in your prayers. A lot of pastors are dropping out, and Timothy wanted to drop out because he was struggling. People were doubting his, 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 his wisdom. They were doubting his position, and they were, they were bullying him in essence. And he says, don't let them bully you. Don't let them phase you. He says, I want you to be an example. I like this word example because it actually means to be an imprint or a mold. It, it, it actually means to strike and you will have a, a picture there. I, I, I love this. He says, he says, every time you strike, they shouldn't see a picture of you. They should see a picture of who? Christ Jesus. 
He says, he says, everywhere you go, you are to walk like him, talk like him, move like him, do the things that he did because you follow the Savior, the God of both heaven and, and earth. He says, I want you to be a type. I want you to be a, a, an example to the believers. He says, I want you to put imprints everywhere. If you've ever seen First 48, you guys are like, like crime scene shows. They look for evidence, right? <laughs> they, they look for DNA. They look for, they look for fingerprints. Guess what? Everywhere we walk, every time I go to the VBAC, I need to leave some spiritual DNA there. Every time I go into Antioch, I need to leave some spiritual DNA. People need to know I'm in the room, that, that God has been in the room because I've been there, because God lives inside of me. Everywhere you go, whether you're at Microsoft, whether you're an athlete, whether you're a student, whether, wherever you do, God should be leaving imprints wherever you go because he resides inside of you. Do you not know that the God of heaven and earth lives inside of you? I want you guys to understand this. We, we don't understand the power that dwells inside of us. Get this, the Holy Spirit, the one who created all things, the one who hovered over, over the waters, the one who wrote the word of God, dwells inside of this old prima pot. And as a result of it, guess what? I have the power of heaven living inside of me at any moment. And guess what? I can change an atmosphere when I walk in. God has called us to be thermostats, not thermometers, that we set the atmosphere because Christ lives inside of us. Greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. So leave your spiritual DNA where you go. You are to be an example. You are to be an example, an implant. You are to, Christians should be leading the pack, setting the tone, being the gold standard, walking the talk, and being the benchmark. That's what God's called us to be. If you want to see how to love, you should look for a believer. If you want to see how to serve, you should look for a believer. If you want to see how to show up and how to, how to, how to go through trials and struggles, you should look to a believer. He says, we ought to be that example. Paul encourages him, he says, in, in, in really four or five different particular ways. He says, in speech, this word actually meant to have your, your, your conversational speech. Jesus said it this way, out of the abundance of a man's heart, he does what? Say it again, loud and proud. All right, he speaks. He says, when you talk, guess what? You're showing what's really in your heart. He says, be an example in your speaking. Now, one of the things we as Christians have a problem, do, problem with, I think in our modern culture, is something that Filipinos call chist missing. Y'all know what y'all ever heard of chist missing? If you got some Filipino friends, chist missing means you gossiping. You know what I mean? We like, to, we like to gossip, and we, we, we clothe it in prayer requests. You know what I mean? You know, we, we like to gossip, and we just, no, we just inform you what's going on. We, we, we chismiss all the time. He says, no, 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 no. He says, be an example in how you talk about people, how you speak life, how do you show up. Because guess what? What you say out of your lips is really the content of your heart. He says, be an example in speech. He also says, be an example in conduct, which means how you show up, how you live. He says, he says, walk the talk. You guys have heard me say this before, but grandmother Melissa Rainey from Tupelo, Mississippi, she says, baby, let the tongue in your shoe speak louder than the tongue in your mouth. Can, can I say that for one more time for the people in the back? She said, baby, let the tongue in your shoe speak louder than the tongue in your mouth. That means your walk should speak way louder than your talk. How you show up matters because guess what? 85% of communication is what? Non-verbal. It's how you show up. It's how you show up as a believer. So if, you, if I'm preaching truth up here and I don't show up in truth, guess what? That there's a disconnect in the message. So Paul tells his, his son, he says, hey, man, he says, show up the right way. He said, let the tongue in your shoe speak louder than the tongue in your mouth. Show up the right way. But he also says in love, this word agape, I got to I got to give a shout out to my boy, Doug Baldwin, DB. I love the, uh, Doug Baldwin because Doug Baldwin, in our time, he's been teaching me this whole concept of love. You know, sometimes you feel like you mentor somebody and they actually mentor you in, in, in return. And, 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 and Doug will always say, love is the key. Love is the key. Love is the key. And you know what? He's 100% right because faith will go, but hope will go. But guess what? Love will endure because love is the key. He says, do you show up unconditionally loving people? unconditionally caring for people, or do you show up using people? Pastor Carl had a, had a saying, he says, you use them, guess what, you'll lose them. But if you serve them, guess what, they'll stay. That's one thing I love about Jesus, that Jesus, he didn't come to be served, but he came to do what? He says, let me wash your feet. 
the knucklehead who going who gonna, who gonna, who gonna to lie on you and, and betray you. He says, come here, Judas, let me wash your feet. <laughs> let me give you some communion. Let me, let me love on you. Let me show you the example. Not, don't, let me, don't, let, don't let how you are change who I am. I got to say that one more time for the people in the back. Don't let how you are change who I am. Man, because people are going to use you. People are going to abuse you. But don't let that change who God has called you to be, to be led. By the Spirit, he says, also in faith. This has nothing to do with one's belief, but also just purely your faithfulness. Can you consistently show up? Can you consistently show up? Now, uh, anybody here married? Some days you have to have, like, like, like some days you don't want to show up, right? <laughs> Am I the only one? You know what I'm saying? Some days, I know Cindy be like, man, I just wish I'd smack you in your head. I was like, <laughs> and, and, and she would probably be right, you know. But, 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 but can you be faithful and consistently show up in love? Can you consistently show up and say, I'm sorry? Can you consistently show up and forgive? Can you consistently show up and be faithful? And God says, more than your marriage, because your marriage is just a picture of the reality of what I've done for you. He says, can you show up faithfully in serving me and loving me and loving other people? Can you love, other, love me by loving other people? Jesus says, he says, he says Lord, when do, we, when do we feed you? When do we come visit you in the prison? When do we do all these things? He says, when you did it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. Can you faithfully show up? Can you be consistent? Can you have that consistency, Timothy, even though... It gets hard. Even though you're in a godless culture, even though you're struggling, can you faithfully show up? And lastly, he says, impurity. It describes describes a quality of moral purity of a pure mind and especially conveys chastity or sexual purity. If you know anything about uh, sexuality in our culture, it is is rampant. I mean, it's it's insane. And, And Paul is telling his protege, Timothy, he says, Hey, anything, you want something to kill your ministry? He says, fall into sexual immorality. That has taken more pastors and more believers out than anything. Fall into sexual immorality. He says, what are you looking at? What are you thinking on? What are you dwelling on? What are you doing? Do, do, you, do you walk in light and not in darkness? He says, he says, be a pure man. As a person who does a lot of marriage counseling, one of the things that, or premarital counseling, one of the things that I always ask couples is like, do, have, you, you, you guys are okay with, with, with a other person's sexual past. And they say, what do you mean by that? So well, we know that the statistics show that if you have more than six partners in your sexual past, there's an 85% chance you'll get divorced. Those are statistically true statistics. We know that STDs and HIV, I don't know if you guys know what's going on in Houston right now. Anybody from Houston in here? But, but, but it's like an, uh, there's an HIV epidemic going on in the city. And people are dying left and right in clinics because of sexual immorality. He tells them, he tells Timothy, he says, be an example in your purity. Be an example in your faithfulness. Be an example in love. Be an example in your, in your conduct and in your conversation. Uh, take away for you guys, Antioch, please write this down. Whether you're young or old, every believer is called to set an example of how they speak, behave, and live out their faith. This includes demonstrating love our walk, faithfulness, and purity in in our daily lives. Question for you. How are you living out these requirements of Scripture? Because guess what? You, You don't represent you. You represent who? The Lord Jesus Christ. You guys ever heard that song? My life is not my own. I can sing a little bit too, or not you? To you I belong. <laughs> I give myself, I give myself to you. Come on. <laughs> How have you allowed the power of the Spirit and the presence of the Word to empower you to live it out? How have you done that? Paul encourages his protege, being an example. Number, point number two, we see in verse 13, he tells him to commit to the Word. He says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. I I love this because he says, I want you to devote yourself. He says, I want you to give your full self, devote yourself, be devoted to the public reading of Scripture, exhortation, and to teaching. Now, this is no knock towards personal devotion, 
But, but in that day, when they read scripture, they're to stand up publicly and read it. Why did the Jews do this? For the simple fact that you are held accountable for what you heard. And so a lot of times in in churches today, we're getting away from the word of God and we're getting to the book of opinions, as Pastor Hutch used to say. (laughs) We like to tell people what we think and not necessarily what God said. And when you read the word of God, guess what happens? the, the, The congregation and yourself are held accountable to it. And so this is how God grows people. You guys should write this down. God takes his word by his spirit and transforms his people. He says, God's word, God's spirit transforms individuals. That's what he does. And a lot of times people do it just the word without the spirit. You get legalism. <laughs> and sometimes you get the spirit without the word, you get fanaticism. But guess what? The balance there of biblical Christianity, when you have the word plus the spirit of God working with a hardness that's, that's yielded to God, will bring transformation to look like the son of God. So he says, I want you to, Give yourself, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture and to exhortation or encouragement. It actually means to place confidence in people's heart. I I want to inspire you by God's Spirit that you can do what God's Word says, that you can love well, show it well, talk well. You You can demonstrate and be an example wherever God has placed you. Wherever God has placed you, when people look to you, they can say, that person's been with, the, with this man named Jesus. He says, encouragement. Also in teaching. This is whether the act of teaching or the doctrine of Christianity or, or the Bible. Biblical doctrine. It's interesting. There's such an importance on biblical sound Doctrine. We have to know what the word says in order to do what the word says. If you're off in doctrine, guess what? You'll be off in practice. Orthodoxy precedes orthopraxy. So right belief or right right teaching precedes right living. So if you think one thing is right and is really wrong, but you're practicing that thing, what does that make you? Say wrong. <laughs> That makes you wrong. So, so, so uh, get this. P- Paul was telling the, 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 the church, I think it was at uh, the Galatian church, he says, man, who betwixt you? Who said you got saved and you got to work still? Uh-uh. Salvation is not, not, not by works. Guess what? You are, you, you are saved not by works. You actually work because you're saved. He says, you ain't got to earn nothing. You can't purchase it. If you could purchase it, guess what? You'll get the glory for it. And guess what? I don't know if you know this, but extra, extra, read all about it. God shares his glory with no man. He says, to him be the glory, <laughs> the honor, and the praise forevermore. God don't share none of his glory with anybody because guess what? If he shared his glory with anybody, guess what? It would, you would be God. And one thing I know I'm not. I'd be, I'm a terrible God. You are a terrible God, if you can be honest with yourself. You are a terrible person trying to play the Lordship role. So he says, understand what's really right. Do you understand sound doctrine? Unsound teaching, unsound doctrine has allowed many groups who are unbiblical, who think they're biblical, to rise up and lead people astray. You got to understand sound doctrine. Write this down. Key takeaway is this. We as a church body must ground ourselves in Scripture. I want you to bathe yourself in Scripture and the importance of, of teaching and encouragement. The public reading of Scripture and the teaching and teaching should be the central to the life of the believer and the life of church. The one reason I love Antioch, and we know it sometimes, can I get an amen? It's hard to be at Antioch sometimes. No, no, I'm, so, so I'm only going to confess that, right? Sometimes it'd be good to go to a church where they got AC. You know what I mean? <laughs> and you ain't got to shut it, set up and tear down, but that's okay. But the one thing I know about Antioch, they're going to stand on the word of God. <laughs> I'll take that over any creature conference any day of the week because I know I'm going to get the word of God. I can't say that about a bunch of churches. I might get the opinions of the pastor, but I know here I'm going to get the word of God. I can't say that about many other churches because I'll get the opinions of culture, but I hear, I know I'm going to get the word of God. 
question for you, Antioch, for pondering. Are you committed to deepening your personal study of the Bible and to engage in teaching and encouragement of others in their faith? We got to commit to the word. Verse 14, he says, do not neglect the gift that you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Point number three, write this down. This is called grace in action. Grace in action. Paul tells Timothy, he says, don't neglect the gift. He says, don't neglect the gift. This word gift in the original Greek is charisma. Say it with me, charisma. The word grace is charis. And the word gift is charisma. They teach you in seminary that whenever you have the pre-six M-A, that means something that's said before is in action. So when you have a gift... It is grace, not not stagnant, but grace, what? In action. (laughs) He says, it is an actionable grace. Get this, the thing about God's grace, it just don't save you just by itself. Guess what? It also transforms you and changes you from the inside out to minister not only to you, but to others. There is a grace that God has put on our heart that he wants us to have in action. And, 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 and I love this because a lot of us have, we all have as a believer, spiritual gifts. So can, I, can I go back here real quick? Gift is charisma. You guys know what the word spirit is in Greek? It's pneuma. P-N-E-U-M-A. The word new actually means breath or wind. And the word ma is, oh man, they listen to today, Pastor Carl. They heard something today. So get this, when the Spirit of God is inside of you, oh, let me go back over here one more time. <laughs> let me go back over here one more time. When Adam was, was, was created, was he created with life? Ah, uh-uh. God did what? He breathed the breath of life. It's the same Hebrew word as breath. And guess what? The spirit is the same Hebrew word, as, the Greek word as breath, as in action. So when the breath of God, the life of God is in action in your life, guess what happens? You, you teach well, you preach well, you do all the things that God has gifted you to do. So he says, he says, my life is in action in your life. That means there should be some kind of movement inside of you when the spiritual gift is there. He says, don't neglect the thing that I placed inside of you to bring action that will bless others and bless you in return. It's the life of God moving inside of you. <laughs> and I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I get excited for my Seahawks. I get excited for them. But you guess what? That's a temporary life. <laughs> but I get excited about other things, but that's temporary. But when the life of God gets inside of me, Man, it'll change the game. It'll change everything. So let me ask you a question, Antioch. Are you neglecting your gift? Are you neglecting your gift? God says, my spirit is moving inside of you. You guys do know that the spirit of God is the thing that saves you. He says, when you get saved, he says, you receive this thing called the Holy Spirit. It is the, it is the holy breath of God <laughs> moving inside of your life. And guess what it does? It produces gifts of grace. That should always be in action. And Paul is telling Timothy, he says, hold on, bro. You remember what happened to you. You remember that time that they laid hands on you and your life was transformed. You remember what your grandmother and your mother placed inside of you, son. Don't neglect that gift because there's an action that comes with that gift. There's a movement that comes with that gift. There's a surrender that comes with that gift. There's a submission that comes with that gift. There's a yes, Lord, that comes with that gift. Get this. Jesus even modeled it for us. I'm getting off topic here, but I'm, I, I want to preach this. Can I do this real quick? We, we have these people who don't believe in the Trinity. But, but, but what happened when Jesus got baptized? <laughs> you hear nothing about Jesus' life until he got baptized by his first cousin, who didn't really know that he was a savior. He says, and then the spirit descended like a what? Dove. 
And God says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well Please get this. You have all three people right there at the same time. You got the father speaking from heaven. You got the spirit coming down like a dove. And you got the son being baptized. And guess what? He goes not to go do miracles, right? He gets baptized. He goes to be tested and tempted and tested. Because when God saves you, guess what? It don't make it better. Sometimes he tests you to see if it's real. He takes him 40 days into the wilderness and tests him that he may be tested in three areas, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And guess what Jesus did? It's going to take us back to our previous point. Every time he was tested, he would say these words, it is written. <laughs> the question of the day, who are you going to depend on? You're going to depend on what you think or what was written. He says, it is written, man shall not by live by bread alone. It is written, it is written. That was what Jesus said. He gave us an example, even though he was the perfect one. He says, I got to do this so those who come after me, the blueprint will follow my lead. It's written. It's written. He says, don't neglect the gift. He says, Timothy, I, I know things are hard. I know they're talking about you. I know they're trying to punk you. I know, I know they're not supporting you like they should. I know they're not giving like they should, but don't, 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 don't neglect the gift. Because guess what? Because you have these circumstances, don't let the circumstances change the call of God on your life. Continue to do what God has called you to do. Now get this, some great Christians' work has been done on less than ideal circumstances and conditions. You guys know that John Bunyan was wrongfully jailed when he wrote The Pilgrim's Progress. Do you not know that Sir Walter Scott authored some of his famous classics at an advanced age because uh, uh, he had to pay off more than half a million dollars of debt? (laughs) <laughs> that was legally not, he was legally not responsible for. Do you not know that, that Beethoven composed some of his best symphonies when he was a deaf man? Ooh, how you a deaf dude? You can't hear something, but yet you can compose some of your best stuff. Guess what? It don't have to be, circumstances don't have to be right or have to be perfect in order for you to honor and serve God. I, I love this. Richard Allen, born a slave, purchased uh, his freedom and started the AME church. Anybody know what the AME church is? African and Methodist Episcopal. It was the first black church denomination in America. He faced racism, discrimination, and violence in his ministry. Sojourner Truth, whose real name is, where's my girl, Isabella. Isabella Bumfrey, who faced racism and sexism, was an itinerant evangelist. I didn't know this until I studied Sojourner Truth. Like She was an itinerant evangelist who talked about women's rights from the Bible that God says there's neither male nor female, slave nor free, that we're all the same at the cross. Do you guys not know that her whole ministry was based off a biblical truth? And last but not least, Howard Thurman, Morehouse man. Where are my Morehouse men in here? I see you, Jason, in the back. Morehouse man, can I not say mentor to Martin Luther King Jr.? You know what he did? He started the first multi-ethnic church in the middle of San Francisco in 1944 in the middle of Jim Crowism, in the middle of segregation, and they had Asian people, white people, Hispanic people, Hawaiian people, black people. They had all races together saying, you know what? We're going to worship God on earth like it is where? In heaven. (laughs) We're going to do what God has called us to do, even though they're killing our brothers and sisters in South in the South. Even though uh, 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 racists can't get along, we're going to show that in the church, They can get along. And this, Martin Luther King would not be who he is today, who we revere today, without Howard Thurman. It was one man who says, I'm not going to let the circumstances stop me from doing the call of God in my life. Verse 15, point number four, we have this thing called point of focus. He says, practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all will see your progress. He says, be diligent. He says, keep at it. Keep going. Don't give up. Be diligent. He says, absorb. That means to be immerse yourself, devote yourself wholly and fully in these things that, he says, if you do these things, guess what's going to happen? Your progress will be made evident to all. In counseling, they taught us that point of focus refers to the concept of directing one's attention or concentration to a specific object, task, or thought. You see that picture up there. It's like you're focusing on that thing. My mentor, when I was going through uh, counseling, the guy who counseled me, Tim, would say this. He says, Jonathan, the things that you focus on is the thing that you will see. 
And ain't that so true? My, I can't tell y'all a story. My kids got so enamored by Teslas. And they was like, we see Teslas everywhere. And they were like, Tesla, white Tesla, Tesla, blue Tesla. And then all of a sudden, I start seeing these Teslas. I'm saying into my head because my kids got me focused on these Teslas. It's amazing. The thing that you focus on is a thing that will consume you. Get this. If you focus on evil, all you will see is evil. If you focus on racism, guess what all you're going to see? R- racism. If you focus on pain, all you will see is pain. But if we fix our eyes on Jesus, <laughs> he said, the author and finisher of our faith. He says, where do you put your focus? Where do we put our focus? We all know this uh, famous swimmer, the most decorated Olympian of all time. His name is, y'all see him? <laughs> Michael Phelps. Man, he faced intense pr- competition and pressure throughout his career. He was struggling to maintain focus amid the pressures of being an elite athlete. You know what he would do? He would simplify his focus. He says, I'm not going to focus on being a gold medalist. I'm just going to focus on just one day, getting better today. And he had this term he he coined where he's just going to focus on what can I get better with today? Uh, In football, we call it the one degree, uh, getting better by one degrees. At some point, if you start at 170 and you, you get to better one degrees, Every day, guess what's going to happen? You're going to get to 212, and you're going to, you're going to be boiling. So can you get better at one thing every day? And his consistent focus, as Paul was telling Timothy, made him great. He says, I don't want to look at the end goal. Let's look at the goal for the day. God don't want you to focus on what you're going to be 10 years from now. He wants you to focus on what you're going to be 10 minutes from now. He says, focus on today, because guess what? Tomorrow has its own what? It has its own issues. It has its own troubles. Sufficient is the day for his own trouble. So Phelps focus on today. He says, if you focus on today, guess what's going to happen? People are going to see you daily. Grow in God and your progress. This is a unique word. It's pro, pro, uh, pro uh, kopes. I forgot how to say it in Greek. It actually means to pioneer something. It's a picture of uh, a, a person whacking the bush and preparing the way for the army. This is what Paul is saying. He says, Timothy, in your daily consistency, in your daily focus, and focusing on Jesus, guess what you're going to do? You're going to pave the way for all the people behind you. Can I, can I talk to our husbands and fathers in here today, the future husbands and fathers, if you can focus on loving your wife today, and loving your Lord today, guess what you're going to do? You're going you're gonna to pave the way for your kids to love their, their wives and love their, 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 their husbands and love their people. And, 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 and guess what you're going to do? You're going to pave the way that the gospel is seen. Get this. We, the one thing that I do know is my mom shared the gospel to me, but my dad demonstrated, demonstrated it in front of me. He loved my mom to death. He loved her to death. And I saw that day after day after day after day. Thomas Edison said, restlessness is the discontent, and discontent is the first necessity of progress. Show me a thoroughly satisfied man, and I will show you a failure. Are you content with where you are in your faith? <laughs> Have we ever said this in, in our faith? Mama, I made it. <laughs> Got all the Jesus I want. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh-uh. Jesus is addictive. I can't, I can't get enough. I just want to get more and more and more. He's like those Lay's potato chips you just can't have. <laughs> One. Key takeaway to that in this is that when we have a continual focus on our spiritual life, growing faith and character is a process that requires dedication, consistency, and effort. How often do you make time? to grow in your faith. Lastly, in closing, verse 16, be a watchman. He says, keep a close watch on yourself and your teaching. Persist in this, for in doing so, you will save both yourselves and others. Paul emphasizes the need for self-examination, the vigilance over one's personal life and teaching. He says, this careful attention ensures that one's life and message aligns with the gospel. Socrates said this, an unexamined life 
is not worth living. In the black community, we would say, you better check yourself before you. Ooh, I got some up in the house today. He said, check yourself before you wreck yourself. The greatest key to a successful ministry is this, perseverance. It's not giftedness. It's not skill. It's do you show up every day. Perseverance, consistently. Can you consistently show up every day, Timothy, Antioch? And in doing this, you will ensure your salvation both for yourselves and for those who hear you. Get this, Paul is not implying that Timothy would or, would or could earn his salvation by paying close attention to it or persevering, but he would, and, uh, he would assure an abundant entrance into paradise. He says, I can't, I'm not telling you that if you do it, you and people you get going to get saved, but know this, if you, if you do it right, guess what's going to happen? God's going to save some people because of your witness, because of your example. In closing, takeaway, if we regularly assess ourselves, in our doctrine, then we will remain steadfast in living out the teaching of the gospel. How often do you regularly assess your spiritual health and doctrinal understanding? In closing, church, let us be a community like Elias. You guys remember the lighthouse example? Pulling men and women not from the depths of the ocean, but from the pit of hell. And in doing so, we will see others follow our example and follow suit. But you can't do this unless you have the Lord Jesus. Every eyes closed, head bowed.